Jenny, thanks so much for joining me. If you would, tell me a little bit about your professional background and experiences. I was spawned from a computer science professor and an elementary education professor. And so maybe this was my destiny, I don't know. But um, I, I did my undergrad at Slip Rock University where I currently teach in health and physical education. I have a master's degree in uh, performance coaching from Edinburgh University, the one in Scotland, not the one uh, in Northern Pennsylvania. Um, and I did my doctoral degree at the University of New Mexico in curriculum and instruction um, focused on uh, physical education pedagogy. Outside of education, um, I student taught dirt while I was a, uh, a, an undergrad at Slippery Rock at, at um, the American School Foundation in Mexico City, Mexico. And there I was exposed to more of a fitness-based model for physical education with high school students where the students came in, each student wore a heart rate monitor. Each class was worth about 25 points and they got one point for every minute that they were in their uh, target heart rate zone. It was really one of the first times I was exposed to, you know, heavy technology use in physical education. And students would come in during study hall to try to make up for lost points. Students would come in before school start, started to, to try to earn more points or stay after school. I was also exposed to, at that time, this is back in the day before all heart rate monitors were coded. And so I, I was exposed to students reaching over and stealing the heart rate readings from the somebody uh, working out next to them and how we worked through those situations. We just reset their watch and they restarted at zero. That was my Mexico City story. I substitute taught actually in inner city Philadelphia for a short amount of time, health and PE. My first full-time teaching job was in Columbia, Illinois, where I taught uh, grades five through eight health and physical education, then moved to the elementary school level and pro taught pre-K um, physical education up to grades four. And also in the summers, I taught high school health in Columbia. After that, I uh, married someone who is active duty Air Force, my wife. Uh, and so we were in uh, in Sirlik Air Base, Turkey for two years, and I worked for the um, U.S. Air Force as a civilian exercise physiologist, and I was in charge of the fitness program there. Then uh, I worked in my doctoral degree teaching physical education, teacher education courses at the University of New Mexico while working on that, and then I taught PEAT courses as well at Winthrop University, where I was, um, my first year there, I was asked to create a class called Technology and Physical Education. About a year or so later, I created and taught a class, which was a technology class for sport administration master's students, so like sport management technology class. And then I was the lead author on the human kinetics textbook that uh, you're using for your course, technology for physical educators, health educators, and coaches. So hope, hopefully that's not too long of an answer, but that's, uh, that's me in a nutshell. In a nutshell, I can't imagine to hear the experience like they, that was the abridged version. I, how exciting. And some, so many of those um, experiences sound like, um, especially there in Mexico City, where you, uh, it was a, it was a cool learning experience and things that you had to navigate that you didn't anticipate were going to show up and, and working through that with your, perhaps your cooperating teacher as a, as a young professional, this is what we're seeing. How do we solve this? It sounds like that sort of has sort of been a, this is what we need. And then how do we solve it? I ran a high school cross country, collegiate track, collegiate cross country. And, you know, I'd used heart rate monitors before, but actually managing the classroom management of technology use is a whole nother story, especially whenever each student has their own piece of technology. Wow. And, um, and learning how to practically apply the use of technology is a skill in itself, not just knowing how to use it yourself, but how do you manage it with the class. Right. And I think that's critical and perhaps sh will show up and does show up in a lot of what we talk about in these classes and, and as students have to think through not just the tool and the technology, but its value and, and how the students are going to engage with it and engage with it in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm.
Seth, tell me about your current position and what are you doing there at Slippery Rock? I taught for several years in the Department of Public Health at Slippery Rock, and now I am teaching in the Department of Exercise Science and Athletic Training at Slippery Rock University of Pennsylvania. Uh, a lot of my research um, over the past 10 years was focused on integrating sport video games and extra games or motion-based video games into physical education. And then in about 2016, things started to shift toward esports, the competitive side of video gaming, and colleges starting to offer collegiate scholarships for esports uh, teams and players. And so I was tasked with creating esports courses at Slippery Rock, and we started an undergraduate minor in esports um, this past fall. And so that's what I'm doing right now is is teaching esports courses as well as um, supervising exercise science interns. Talk about seeing a trend and seeing something that was that's um, relevant to students and relevant to society and then embracing that within uh, an academic program. That's really interesting. And, and a lot of the research that I'm trying to do is highlighting some of the the dangers of technology and sedentary behavior and particularly at the higher levels of competitive gaming where the belief of what you call grinding more and more gameplay is the only way I get better, but that's not necessarily the case. And there's a lot of health risks, both physical and, and mental health risks for players and just people who play too much video games. So trying to shed light on, on that. As an aside, and we can touch on this later, Illinois State has built now an esports you know, enterprise, but as far as academically, that we haven't caught up, got on that wave just yet. So it'd be interesting to talk to you about that sort of as a supplement. Because of the pandemic where universities have been struggling with enrollment and, and uh, retention, you know, that is an area where some universities are moving toward. They're trying to attract students or keep their current students through, through esports. So when you hear someone say, maybe casually or within an educational setting, that educators are innovating with technology or there's innovative technologies in schools, what comes to mind for you? Some of the first things that pop in my head when I hear that would be utilizing iPads or smartphones or apps, heart rate monitors, pedometers, or some other types of, of activity trackers. More of a 30,000 foot view, I think about objectively measuring physical activity. I think about um, the uses of technology for classroom management and organization. I think about utilizing technology to provide augmented feedback for students, concurrent uh, while they're participating, as well as individualized feedback that a, a human can't give individualized feedback to, to 30 students at one time, but your technology can assist with that. So as well as professional development, where people are able to utilize technology, which people are listening to this podcast or watching this vodcast right now where hopefully they'll learn a thing or two through technology. In what ways have digital tools and digital technologies changed your approach um, as a professional and maybe how you plan, uh, deliver, or assess student learning in your classes? For me right now, uh, in higher education, I, I'm using it to augment instruction, to use for classroom management, to help with assessment, to provide individualized feedback with learning management systems. When I was teaching uh, K through 12 and all, even coaching, I coached cross country and track and I still coach elementary cross country and track uh, locally. I utilize technology with elementary kids in that environment through uh, motivating them with portable wireless speaker I mean, if, if you're outside in a field and you're wanting kids to run and then you bring out a speaker and you play a song that they like that's maybe on Kids Bop, all of a sudden you've increased things by, you know, 150% energy levels because the kids are now dancing and they're singing along and, and that's a huge motivator. And there's a ton of research to support that how music increases intensity levels and, and, and activity levels and, and motivation levels. When I was teaching health and PE, uh, we utilized heart rate monitors to move beyond just the PE teacher's perceived exertion level of the students or the individual student of how they felt they were exercising to objectively 
measuring their intensity, as I mentioned with uh, Mexico City, but even in, in Columbia, Illinois, where we used heart rate monitors there at the lower elementary levels, utilizing pedometers and being able to have students get excited about step counts. And when they're lined up to leave the gym, they're still jumping up and down because they want to get a few more uh, counts on the pedometer. And, and that's the type of stuff that technology can afford. General education, we might call that um, zone of proximal development, you know, Vygotsky meeting the students where they are that's still at a challenging level. Well, in PE, that same term is like meeting students where their current fitness level is. And if you're having students exercise at a certain intensity level, the student that might be less fit, might be overweight, might be on the outset exercising at a slower pace, but that might be what's really appropriate for them. And we're able to tell that because of a heart rate monitor where the person who is more fit is moving at a faster pace and they still might not be exercising hard enough if they're not reaching that lower level of their target heart rate zones. Really what you've described is differentiated instruction and using a tool that can provide some objective data for teachers to inform how they are monitoring and providing feedback and then differentiating for the individuals to meet them where they are. So thank you for making me sound smart. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you made yourself sound smart. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, this next question asks about how tech has enhanced your efficiency or effectiveness and, and not to put words in your mouth, but you've already mentioned about augmenting your feedback and providing individual feedback and you've got a class of 30 and how does a teacher really substantively interact with each child or learner? Unless you're utilizing some additional tool or resource. I don't have another teacher in my gymnasium but I've got 29 or 30 other humans who could feed back to one another, or I have these tools that are providing information to help students make informed decisions for themselves. So I kind of- put Yeah, let me, I, I do want to touch um, yeah. upon this. And we talk about this in our textbook, I think even starting in the first chapter, because it's pretty important. And that's the idea that some people will want to try to implement technology for the sake of implementing technology. It's, oh, um, I can't wait till somebody sees me using an iPad in class. But if it's not used to meet a specific learning objective, and, and maybe if there's less of a learning curve for you to uh, accomplish the same learning objective, then maybe you don't need to use the technology. So I think you, anytime you're, you're wanting to, in, to implement some type of technology into your teaching, you have to think about what's the purpose of it. Is this at an appropriate level where the students will be able to grasp it? And is it meeting the learning objective? And if it's not, or if you're just doing it just to seem cool in front of your, your teaching <laughs> colleagues, for lack of a better phrase, then uh, reconsider whether you should use it or not. And I, I'm not discouraging people from using it, but I want you to question what's the purpose of the technology use. And if it's making you more efficient, if it's giving students more feedback, then use it. But if it's not, if it's not meeting an objective or helping you teach more effectively or assess more effectively, then maybe you shouldn't use it. You're not an outlier. So I think you, um, Seth, are my fifth or sixth conversation and nearly everyone has reinforced that mm -hmm. um, and one of the teachers she's in Kentucky Crystal Williams said I have a low tech I have a no tech low tech and high tech option for almost all of my decisions almost you know in every unit or not every lesson per se but I have got a no tech I've got a low tech and I've got a high tech choice and I in and sometimes the no tech choice is the best. And I loved how she framed that. She teaches uh, at the elementary level and she's pretty dynamite. And um, I appreciate that because she's she's a critically thinking about what's best for her learners and what's best for her, not just using the tech for tech's sake, like you said. Well, and I think that um, especially maybe five years ago, even 10 years ago, where all of these schools were getting grants to get iPads. And they were just handing out iPads, particularly the classroom teachers with no training. 
-hmm. And then you get into talking about their kids coming home from school and they're on the iPads when they shouldn't be, they're emailing, uh, they're doing, they're on apps that they shouldn't be, and they had no um, protocols for the use of them, and the, the teachers weren't taught how to most effectively utilize them in the classroom. And so it, it's great, like I said, to, to be able to have access to that, especially during a pandemic. It was great to be able to have those portable devices that you could do online instruction at home, but sometimes it, it can cause problems, especially time on task and a distraction if teachers aren't on the ball with knowing how to implement them correctly. Have you observed changes in the way that your students or perhaps your athletes engage with uh, the, the information and content, perhaps how they interact with one another, or perhaps how they interact with you as a result of using different digital technologies or tools? Yeah, I'll, I'll give an example of one um, where we uh, had a station during an activity where students were performing a motor skill and there was an iPad set on a, a tripod and that we're using a time delay app. And so what that does is, is it records while the student is participating in the skill, let's talk about shooting a basketball. And then the student could go to the iPad while the next student was shooting and it would display on the iPad what happened 30 seconds after it so the student could watch themselves performing the skill. And so we could have a, a very basic checklist for them to think about what, you know, where their elbow should be, where their uh, balance was, where their feet placement was, wh wh what their follow through was. And it's, it was great because a lot of times people don't trust what you're saying, especially if they're the type that doesn't like to receive feedback. Like my kids, they don't want to be told that they did something wrong, but if they can self-assess then you know the camera's not going to lie. So number one, they can self-assess with that checklist. And then number two, once the students have gotten used to it, then they start to interact with themselves and they start talking about that dialogue of critiquing their critical elements of the motor movement amongst themselves where you can have the students discuss uh, whether they were uh, performing the skill accurately. So yeah, th that type of interaction where it's high order thinking skills that you're reaching where it's, it's more than just rote memorization, but it is applying what you're trying to teach. And then, you know, the highest level of evaluation. Love it. And in thinking along those lines, what came to mind as you were talking was for my undergraduate students who are learning to be teachers, it's hard for them to receive feedback. Yeah, when you're observing them, yeah, it depends I, on the student, but yeah, and the ones that don't, it's they're difficult to work with. You know, it's like <laughs> you've got to learn. We're trying to teach them to give feedback, right? And in this example, you know, whether it's an undergraduate or a K twelve learner, your example of the time delay app would be a, a lovely ex um, example of not only learning to receive feedback, right, from someone else is a skill learning to to identify behaviors in myself or the others and then to be analytical enough to say these are the two or three things that have to be prioritized to solve the problems that i'm seeing so both as a teaching and a learning skill in a significant way that higher order thinking not only am i learning to then give feedback but receiving feedback can be really hard as well if you don't mind to either reiterate what were some of those motivators for you to start using technology yeah um so the the student teaching experience in mexico city uh when i started uh coaching high school cross country i utilized gps units mm -hmm. to try to individualize training and really also to make sure the students weren't just hanging out at dairy queen during practice oh, which the they, <laughs> yes <laughs> i didn't have enough at that point, this was when GPS units were a lot more expensive and not everybody had one on their watch. This is back in the day. So we had a, about four different uh, units and I would group the student, the, the runners up by ability level and they would run uh, a certain distance that I assigned that group who were all should be a similar type of level. And that was something that, you know, we kept track of and, and I could um, 
utilize that to to make sure that they were doing their training. But in in physical education, I think that one of the biggest things was the use of heart rate monitors to to track effort levels in PE. I'm sure you've come across PE teachers that you ask them their grading scheme, and it might be like 50% is effort, you know, 25% is whether they brought the clothes they should to dress out and, you know, another, I don't know, 25% is some type of cognitive testing. And, and what the heart rate monitors that that technology does is it helps remove that um, ambiguity of what is the effort within physical education. Some of the research that I've done is to what extent you can utilize motion-based video games to teach skills in physical education. And I've always been interested in because gaming is becoming so mainstream. And you can you know, even see it in the commercials on television right now where they're using video gaming to attract the attention of, of audiences to pay attention to car commercials or to any product that's out there. You know, we found that it can help with burning calories and it can help with feelings that someone may want to participate in that activity outside of the gaming environment. So I've done studies with uh, virtual rock climbing and students have increased their intentions to want to go rock climbing after they've experienced the virtual environment of it. And also the uh, idea that you can utilize um, some of these motion-based games for people that might have an injury or a disability that they may not be as easily able to participate in, for example, rock climbing very easily in the real world environment, but the virtual environment, they can find success in that. You mentioned differentiated instruction, and that's built into almost every video game where you can pick the skill level. Am I the beginner, intermediate, or advanced? And each game typically has different terminology for that. But, you know, that is trying to meet the player at the level of where they're at. And I've done some other work with to what extent playing a sport video game teaches people about the rules and strategies of of the game and so uh, i've done a study with uh international students playing madden so most of them didn't know much about american football and after several uh games with madden they did increase their their knowledge level um, about the rules strategies player positions official signals and the other thing was really neat is we did focus groups afterward and they felt more connected to american society because they oh. would go to buffalo wild wings and they'd hear people cheering and watching television and they really didn't have any clue what was going on and after um, eight 30 minute gaming sessions, they felt like, okay, they weren't experts, but they knew you had four tries to make it 10 yards and had to pass or run past the line of scrimmage. And some of their super basics that us, we take for granted because we've grown up in this culture. And, and I've done a similar study with Americans on a video uh, gaming version of cricket, where they try to um, assimilate baseball to cricket because it's the closest sport they know, but there's a lot of rules that are different and, and they increase their knowledge level on that. I guess the one la last thing I wanted to mention, which was a unique finding of the rock climbing study where I had people who had never rock climbed before do it in the virtual environment, half the group and the other half started in the indoor rock climbing wall and they switched. And one of the unique things I, I found from that, and this was from some focus groups afterward too, was that the majority of them believe that the best way to climb up a, a wall is like a ladder where you just go straight up. And when you're on a rock wall, I mean, the wall's right in front of your face. But you're, when you're playing the video game, it is a 3D version where you see the entire wall and you're that avatar on the wall. And because of the perspective of you could see the entire wall, they realize the strategy, the best way to get up the wall may not be to go straight up like on a ladder, but it might be a few steps to the left and then zigzag to the right. And so the strategy of rock climbing was enhanced in some aspects. And so overall, research has shown that, that 
sort of having direct instruction, the traditional physical education, along with the video game can help with their overall learning. And it's not like um, the video gaming is useless or certainly the direct instruction is not useless. It can be used as an augmented enhancement of a lesson. But with gaming, you run the risk of time on task where only so many people can play at one time. Dance Dance Revolution is a good solution to that where you have interactive mats and people are, uh, a whole class can even follow along at one time where they're, they're going on the same steps at the same time. And they have a classroom version of that where each student can even be tracked with their score while the whole class is going, I think up to 25 students. So that was a long answer, but that's sort of some of the most recent research I've done in, with, with gaming and PE. How might what you have found uh, relative to video gaming and its uh, possibilities related to either skill development, strategy development, rule, cognitive understanding, or some of those other findings as you've, as you've mentioned, cultural competence, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Could you see that tying into like online physical education in some ways? For sure. Uh, as the trend may be to have uh, more, more online experiences for learners um, relative to physical education? And if so, can you, you know, kind of, yeah, pontificate on that a little bit? How do you see these perhaps connecting? Do they connect? Is there advantages and disadvantages? Is this the way of the future? Can I don't you... know if I can pontificate, but I can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's what this is. <laughs> So, <laughs> I'm messing with you. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think the, the short answer, yes, because all, all of these games can also have direct chat features where you can have the social interaction with other students mm -hmm. while you're playing the game. And, and really, some of the early research that I found, because I was doing some of the gaming in a, in a gym, and we, we were using consoles, but we weren't using headsets. And some of the really important feedback that students get from these games is auditory feedback, especially from game commentators. You know, when you play Madden, it is like you're actually watching a broadcast and they critique your last play. And so when you're in a gym, if you don't have an audio headset, the gym environment is not very good with hearing that um, feedback from the video game. So if you're doing online PE, certainly it'd be a great way to expose students to a new sport that may, maybe don't know all the rules of. And then if you do the flipped learning environment, they could do some of that, which if you told them their homework was to play video games, I think they would probably love you and you'd be the oh favorite teacher in the school. <laughs> Now that they've got the basics of how to play the sport because they were motivated to, to learn through playing the video game, now we could do it in real life. Mm -hmm. I think the important piece to that is, is that are they getting 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity each day? And if you are replacing that with a sedentary type of video game, a seated video game, then you run into problems where you need to make sure that they're doing physical activity throughout the day, but this would be something to augment in instruction. To give you another example, a study we did with um, rugby, where in a rugby physical education class, we're not going to have them play tackle rugby, right? Mm -hmm. But because they also played the video game version of it, they knew how tackling looked like we didn't do like heavy duty scrums that they do in real life rugby so there was what the students talked about is the safety things that we wouldn't let them do in physical education they learned a whole lot more about because they could see it in the video game which was a really interesting and something i hadn't really thought of before in addition to knowing like a cricket field is massive we obviously were not playing on an official cricket field. And so because they saw what a real cricket stadium looks like in the video game, then they had a lot greater enhanced understanding of it. And, you know, I had one student who was planning on, uh, after that study, going to Australia. They were so excited to go to a cricket match because they knew, had a pretty good basic understanding of the rules of cricket. And it really motivated them to, to want to go watch and even play if the opportunity presented itself. That's really interesting. Those are some fun findings and 
definitely something to be thinking about and you know using some different tools to solve some problems making them into solutions for us for the problems that we're experiencing just because it's a problem and a challenge now doesn't mean we can't translate into that translate that into an opportunity so mm -hmm. i didn't mention but certainly with the online physical education you could integrate some extra games or, or motion-based video games into it and well, you segued pretty nicely by mentioning the cost right, and affordability of some of these tools. Quite a few of our learners and our practitioners out there run on varied budgets um, per year. So let's say that I, I recognize that I, I'm interested in trying out a new tool or a technology in my classroom. What have been your experiences or strategies to acquire these new technologies? Do you have specific um have you found success with specific specific strategies or sources yeah so uh, my dissertation was on to what extent are ncaa division one distance running coaches humanistic no one wanted to give me any money on that <laughs> when i started doing extra gaming and motion-based video gaming research everybody wanted to throw money at that so number one i think you're at an advantage by technology is a hot button topic and I think it's going to remain that for a, lo a long time. So an administrator is definitely more likely to want to put money toward that. But I think some strategies are what other types of curricular uh, objectives can be met outside of physical education to make this a cross-curricular type of request. So connect with the math teacher, connect with the reading teacher, connect with any other type of teacher at the school, especially the one with the big mouth that, you know, is a squeaky wheel and connect with that person and get them on board and tell them why they can maybe use this technology as well as you can use it in health or physical education. So if you're killing more than, you know, one bird with the stone, then they're more likely to, uh, an administrator want to set aside money toward that. And, and the focus is what will this technology do, not what it is. And then certainly we have a, a big section in our textbook about, uh, trying to acquire grants to assist with that. And that really depends on the purpose of the grant that you're applying for, but making sure that whatever the application says for the grant, that you specifically address everything that's listed as to what that grant is for in your grant application. And, you know, throw the word STEM in there and you'll be good to go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, now I guess now it's steam, right? What advice would you have for someone? I'm sure you've come across this individual before once or twice. What advice would you give to someone who is considering a new technology in their PE setting? Definitely read my textbook, <laughs> right? Technology yes, for physical educators, that. health educators, and coaches. But my best advice would be find somebody who is using that technology in the same way that you think you would want to use it and ask them what they like about it and what they don't like about it and what's the brand and what's the model and get as much information about it. And, you know, somebody who's using it in the trenches because they may have it and they might, they might tell you, you know what, I, I like this style, but I probably, if I had to do it over again, I would have ordered this one or this new version of this came out and I would probably look into that. So speaking to people who have practical experience with applying the technology would be super important as well. Great advice. What about that one person who you've met that probably only one person that you've met who's critical about technology in physical education or health or sport? What would you say to that person? What do you mean by critical? Um, technology doesn't belong in physical education. Oh, okay. I think that you have to go back to how the technology is making uh, you a more effective teacher or how the technology is enhancing the student's learning experience. And is that, that's in, in how, if you didn't have the technology, why would things be worse? I will add something to the previous question. Mm -hmm. Twitter is a great platform that if you're considering something, 
everybody wants to put their opinion on Twitter. Now you have to decipher what's good advice and what's bad advice. But if you don't have that person that you know who's using the technology, I would recommend um, going on Twitter and asking the question of what you want answered and put in the particular hashtags. Um, we have, you can um, do at T-E-C-H, the number four H-P-E for our textbook and I'll retweet it for you. And that goes out to about a thousand.